Modern Fairy Sightings podcast. I'm Jo Hickey Hall and I'm really, really delighted to introduce Dr. Simon Young uh, to this episode. So Simon is a historian and author of many books and academic articles on the subject of fairies. He is based at the International Studies Institute in Florence, and um, I've got some of your books here, Simon, that will be familiar to a lot of people watching and listening to this. So, of course, we have the absolutely wonderful Seeing Fairies, which, if you haven't got, is just such a beautiful book to own. And I end up gifting this one particularly to people because it is just such a lovely collection. Um, we'll talk about more about that shortly. Um, Magical Folk which of course Mark Norman and I, well, I'm very honored to share a chapter in there with Mark Norman. That, that is a study of British and um, Irish fairies, 500 AD to the present history and folklore, uh, fairy sightings. And of course, the more recent, the Woolerton Gnomes, which was um, available on Amazon, a collection of um, essays there. So welcome, Simon. I'm so, so glad that you've joined me. We, we've sort of known each other for a while, but this is the first time we've had a proper sort of face-to-face -face chat, which is lovely. And um, I'm very, you know, uh, admire your work greatly, along with many other researchers in this area. So welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great. Yeah, so I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how you ended up studying fairies. Well, um, so my background was in medieval studies and at university and through my 20s, um, I, I specialised in the early Middle Ages. Um, and that, that all came to an end. I think in my late 20s, I became very ill. Um, sorry, not quite. It was a little bit after in my 30s. I had a period of a couple of years where I was very ill and I just got my doctorate in medieval studies um, and I had this shock to my system. And after that, I found I, I did. I'm here today. So clearly I got better. Um, but it was it was a pretty awful time in my life. And when I came out of that, I realised that I wanted to continue studying, but I didn't really want to go back to the things I'd been studying before. Um, and so at that point, I, I looked around and there were various fields that interested me. Um, and I, I gradually found myself being drawn towards British folklore. Um, and this was an area I'd always had quite a bit of an interest in, but I, I'd never published on the subject or read very deeply. And so it, my anniversary is just coming up this summer in that 10 years ago, I'm now 48, so I was in my late 30s, I, I really began to study seriously um, British folklore. And for me, it, it was it was a, a wonderful moment uh, because I, I enjoyed the Middle Ages, but I enjoy studying folklore more, I think. Oh, that's really interesting. So had you been interested in, say, folklore or the subject of fairies as a child at all, or was it more kind of in adulthood? I'd have to think about that. It's, it's a good question, and I think I might even see where the question's leading. What I can say is I remember this vividly, that when I was um, 16 or 17, I, I wanted to go and do um, a special study at a special faculty at a British university and I remember going down I, I came from Yorkshire at that point um, going down by train to visit a professor there and when I was in the bookshop I bought Evans Wentz's Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries and right. I still have that copy of the book and I remember being very excited like I said I think I was 16 17 getting home and reading that. And I have a feeling that already I was building there on an interest that I had before, mm. but I've never really thought that through. And I, I can't give you examples from before that, but I remember I loved that book um, and the book's just sitting there up on the shelf nearby. Um, and so that's a, a special memory for me. Mm. 
Oh, that's lovely. And that's a real classic, isn't it? And one that we all return to again and again. Um, there's so much in there. And every time, every time I pick it up again, I, you know, I find something new or I read it with new eyes. And, you know, so it's, it's a, a real, yeah, that's, that's great. Mm. Yeah, so later on, because what you're very well known for, of course, is the uh, fairy uh, the Fairy Investigation Society, the Fairy Census. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the Fairy Investigation Society and how it how it led to the Fairy Census being released? Yeah, I, I think in a sense, I, I'm not sure which came first. They happened more or less at the same time. And perhaps they even happened simultaneously. Um, but it happened that I was writing an article on the Fairy Investigation Society that was this organisation that had gone through from the late 20s, um, had briefly disappeared in the 1930s and then returned after the Second World War and had then died out in the 1990s. And th these were groups of people um, who studied who studied fairy sightings and tried to bring records of fairy sightings together. And I was particularly fascinated by a figure called Marjorie Johnson, who, when I was writing that article, had just passed on, aged, oh. I think, 101. Um, she was very um, elderly when she died. And she put together this incredible series of fairy accounts that you've already showed us this evening, Joe, which is seeing fairies. And I was lucky enough while doing research to stumble on a couple of Marjorie's friends who were able to get me the manuscript. This is the, the wonderful book, yes. Yeah. Um, and so I had the very great honor of not just publishing an article on the Fairy Investigation Society, but also publishing Marjorie's work. And yeah. that book, I mean, th there are not many examples of this in human history, but it took us 60 years to write it. Um, she started in the 30s and she went all the way through to the 90s. So she was getting reports in the 1930s of people like herself who had fairy experiences. And she continued going down this road and was still collecting experiences, albeit at a reduced rate in the 1990s. Um, and the, the beautiful story with the book is that she managed to find a German publisher, um, but not an English publisher. Um, and the book was relatively successful in German and it was translated from German, not from English, but from the German translation into Czech and into Italian. Um, and I actually, as you said before, I live in Italy and the first time I saw the book was in Italian and my okay. great task was to go backwards and find the original manuscript and this took me several months. And when I found the manuscript and the publisher who was ready to go with the manuscript, I, I became interested simultaneously really in doing two things. The first of all was restarting the Fairy Investigation Society. Um, which, as I said before, died out in the 90s. And the second was recreating a fairy census. Now, Marjorie Johnson had done the fairy census old school. She had written to newspapers and magazines around the world, particularly in the English speaking world, and asked for accounts of people who'd seen fairies. Um, and I felt that with social media, it might be a lot easier to do this today. And so my plan was to launch the fairy census on social media. And I also had perhaps different motivation for Marjorie. Uh, Marjorie Johnson believed passionately in fairies. She had many fairy experiences. Um, when you read her writings, there's almost a sense that she had daily fairy encounters. This was a very important part of her life. And her aim in creating the 400 or so sightings she came across um, in seeing fairies was to prove to the world that fairies really exist. Um, I, I'm a lot more sceptical that it's possible to do something like that in a publication. And so what I wanted to do was, in a sense, more modest. I, I wanted to get reports of people who'd had fairy experiences and I wanted to understand the experience, but above all, to understand what kind of people had these experiences and in what kind of circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same way, when I started the Fairy Investigation Society, the, the Fairy Investigation Society that Marjorie Johnson had belonged to had been very um, uh, 
theosophical. It had been very yeah. much about a certain view of fairies. And I wanted to recreate the society, but recreate it on slightly more ecumenical lines. In other words, there are members of the FIS now who don't believe in fairies, some people who aggressively don't believe in fairies, some people who have fairy experiences, but the thing that brings them all together um, is this interest in fairy law. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like the idea that there are people from different walks of lives, but also with different views on the subject. Yeah, that's really great because this is how, you know, deep conversations can take place you know Absolutely. we need to be able to have a space to to air all of our views and listen to each other and that's kind of how we that's kind of how we evolve and that's that's the Absolutely. great thing about it isn't it yeah. I mean you touched on the fact that she had these fairy experiences can you tell us a little about the couple well, perhaps give us an example of one of the ones that she had had. I know she'd, she'd had them since uh, being a young child, along with her sister. That's right, Dorothy. Dorothy. Um, I actually wrote a couple of years ago an article on Marjorie's life, and it, it was a fairly brief article, but it was just trying to pay tribute, really, to her. Mm. And one of the things I did there was to go through seeing fairies and look specifically at her experiences. And it's clear that she had these experiences from when she was a toddler. She actually had um, cousins who remembered her as a child talking about seeing things in the garden. Wow. Um, and then she had uh, one of her initial memories was waking up in the morning with her beloved sister, Dorothy, in the bed next to her and seeing a fairy that had come in. Um, and she associated it with a plant out in the garden. Yeah. And this fairy was there practically resting on a sunbeam. And she described seeing this fairy and what a wonderful moment it was. And then growing up, there were a series of other um, encounters. And just one I was talking to a colleague about the other day, but she had this incredibly strong bond with her sister, Dorothy. It's one of these cases that perhaps we've all come across where um, sometimes siblings don't marry they end up just living together this is very strong uh, bond between two siblings right. and she remembered this is I think when she was in her 80s um, one evening the fairies came to her in her bed um, and she she had this sense that they were trying to <coughs> excuse me trying to console her and trying to prepare her for something. Uh, and the next day, her sister died. Um, and so this was someone for whom these fairy experiences were built into the fabric of her life. Yeah. Um, and, and I found her a fascinating individual in this sense, A, because she had these experiences, and B, because she was just so easy in having these experiences. Um, I, I don't think it would be the simplest thing in the world today to talk about fairy experiences that someone has in a public setting mm -hmm. but I think in the 50s and the 60s you needed extraordinary courage mm -hmm. um, and Marjorie Johnson just didn't give a damn she she just, she went down a happy road she worked in a lawyer's office in the day she went home and lived with her sister um, she had a beautiful garden and she saw fairies this was this was just how it was yeah. Um, and she, she wasn't prepared to compromise that reality um, yeah. for anyone. And I, I really admired um, that, that courage and that conviction, let's say. Yeah, I really admire her very much. And um, what do you think her intention was with the survey that she was running? What, what do you think she was wanting to, yeah, what do you think her intention was? I mean, it's a little bit like Evans Wentz, who we talked about a few minutes ago. Evans Wentz, when he published the, the fairy faith in Celtic countries, said that his aim was to, to prove that fairies right. existed. And Marjorie Johnson is, is very upfront about this. She, she is uh, someone with religious convictions on, an, on, a, on a mission. Mm. She wants to prove to the wider world that these experiences that she has and not just the figment of her imagination, not that she's making it up, but this is an experience that lots of people have. Um, and however you want to interpret that, you know, th th that's up to you. But that was her aim. Yeah. And it's very clear reading the book that not only is the conviction, but 
she's reaching out. She's trying to say to other people, look, these are real experiences. You can say that 100 of these 400 are nonsense, but what about the other 300? Mm, exactly yeah do you know at all how she responded to people that you know that that were just of the mind that no it's impossible no it's ridiculous but did you ever um come across any examples or having sort of seen the manuscript and maybe got a little bit closer to her in some respects and and what a shame that you lit it sounds like you just missed I, you know I the potential of meeting her and oh yeah. that's just yeah but I'm sure she's there present through you know what you're doing um in, in some way or form if we do go on which I believe we do um and so yeah did you ever get a sense of how she reacted to sort of non like real staunch staunch non-believers as it were it's, it's a great question I I mean, when you say staunch non-believers, um, I, I think of those real, the real materialists, the Richard Dawkins and so on. Yeah. I, I think there, there was probably relatively little contact. But when you read Seeing Fairies, um, there were lots, perhaps not lots, but several comments where she she tut tut let's say it like that. She tut tut at people who just can't take these experiences seriously yeah. um she says look you, how can you dismiss all this evidence um, but that's the typical approach of these people so i i i like the i like this phrase tut tut i think this yeah. is a part of what marjorie johnson was she seems also to have been she comes across as being a very soft person in the book but at the same time and i think you get this from her photograph as well she seems to have been someone who was actually you know she could she defended herself mm. she she was quite sure of her convictions and i can imagine um from what i've heard from other people um and from seeing her photograph that she could probably be quite sharp sometimes right okay yeah that's thank you it's nice to you know uh get to know her a little bit more and um it would be great to uh, post your article that you wrote on her as well. well. I'll put that on the show notes. So you kind of um, sort of relaunched the Investigation Society, as it were. And, um, and now that that's a great website for people to visit, there's so much information on there and lots of links. People can join if they if they you know if they want to, and and of course they can take part in the fairy census. Now, the one that you ran um, about the time that that we met would would be the the 2014 to 2017 census, and there's also another one running. So this is so people can still take part in this. The 2014 to 17 is available on the website that people can go in and view. And um, and that's just, you know, count how many is there about 400 on there? I think I got to 500 with 500. That. So 500 um, accounts that, you know, self-reported accounts on there of from all over the world um, of all different sorts. It might be worth throwing in, Joe, that I mean, you've implied this, but it's absolutely free. Um, yeah. Anyone can download it in PDF. And sooner or later, I'd like to make it or at least part of it into a book version. But the basic version is there and free for anyone to read. And it will remain there and free for anyone to read. And my, my aim, at least in the moment, um, life is complicated. Who knows what will happen? But I hope to bring out um, a second fairy aid census soon. And maybe this will be more like 300 sightings or mm -hmm. um, and I would love in the end. I, I, who knows if I'll have long enough for life to make this happen. But I would love to get to 2000 sightings. Oh, yeah. Um, split up through various volumes. And again, just so it's a tool so people can use it, and whether people are sceptical or believers or something in between, um, it's a pile of data that then people can start delving into. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, at some point you, you had talked about, um, you know, the fact that, OK, you get sceptics and you also get people that, you know, want to uh, ridicule things a bit and have a bit of a laugh. And so you did get people filling out the census and, you know, Bit being a bit silly with it um but actually very very i mean I, I i haven't actually personally read any that i thought were people being silly they these are 
very, very genuine accounts. I mean, you can tell when you're reading them that the person who is writing these accounts very much believes um, and is, is sure of what they have seen. Well, you know, they talk often about how um, helpful it is for them to sort of talk about it within that within the survey. And, um, and I think one of the questions that you ask them is, what do you think fairies are? You know, there's some really nice touches in there of getting getting their their views on the subject overall, and what they think. Um, you know how how things developed for them within the encounter. For instance, um, the time of day it was, how old they were, you know, whereabouts in the world it took place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's a, it's a really brilliantly helpful resource for anybody that is interested in this subject. Do you think, did, you know, fr from the data that you've gathered so far, did you notice or pick up whether there are any kind of patterns in these experiences for people? So I, I came to this as a skeptic and in some senses, I still am a skeptic. I, I, I really don't know what's going on. Um, with these sightings. But in, in this much, I agree with Marjorie Johnson. Clearly something is going on. And it, it's just, it, it would just be the heights of silliness to, to sweep all this away and say, oh, this, yeah. is, this is so much nonsense. As to patterns, I hear probably my personal interest kick in. Um, I, I'm particularly interested in children who have these experiences. Um, and often they're adults remembering having these experiences as children. And certainly there the does seem to be a series of, for me, really interesting experiences around, say, kids age three to 10 or three to 13, say from in infancy all the way through to the beginning of puberty. And then sometimes as well beyond but I'm particularly interested in the patterns there. And I'll just give you one example. Again, this probably just plugs into my own prejudices and curiosities, but I, I find it incredible to compare the experiences that children have in bed. Um, in other words, there are lots of experiences and these continue to roll in yeah. um, where children describe experiences that they've had while trying to get to sleep. And I, I should be more specific here. Usually these are adults remembering experiences they had as children and yes. already that might create some problems. Um, but I, I find those fascinating. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious at the, the different types of experiences, how some are threatening um, and some are, are much less threatening. And so that's that's one pattern that I've noticed. I think another thing I'm interested in, and so Joe, really, I'm not answering your question very well. I'm just talking about my own interests here. No, I think no, that's looks, fine. Who looks into that mirror will 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 find different things. Yeah. Um, but another thing I'm fascinated by are people who have, like Marjorie Johnson did, um, let's say a habit, a fairy habit. Let's call it that. Okay. Whereby <laughs> for a number of years or even right through their life, they have ongoing fairy experiences. And th this is another thing that I, I find curious. It's something that you can find in cultures all over the world, of course. People who write from their, their youngest years have supernatural experiences. Yeah. And here, some people have chosen to classify these supernatural experiences as fairies. And I... I suppose I'm very curious about what kind of person has these experiences and what do they mean, both for the individuals who have these experiences and for society generally. And I suppose that back three or 4,000 years ago, the people who had these experiences were the individuals who communicated with the numinous, with the spirit mm. world, with the gods. And quite where those people find themselves in our digital society, I'm not sure. But it's clear that people are still in that category. Yeah. People are still having that, these experiences. You've interviewed several of them. Um, Marjorie Johnson is a, a class A example of this. Mm -hmm. And so I find people like that really curious. And then I suppose a third category, which is in absolute contradiction to this, 
but perhaps rational people who have a one-off experience yeah. that just blows their mind. And I, I really love those two. Um, because what, what, what can you do with these, with, with these experiences? Um, you know, you're out for a walk in the middle of nowhere and you come across something which is impossible. Exactly. How do you process that? Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's seeing something that could have been a very large butterfly, but sometimes it's something which is a much stronger experience. And you think, well, what's going on there? That's it. Yeah, just makes you know. The, the, those people, when you know, when that happens to them, they start to question all sorts of things in their life and the world around them, don't they? So it is very, it's very interesting. And I agree on the the childhood experiences. That's been coming up quite a bit in in my own research. You know, talking to people. And just the other day, I was speaking to a woman who um, in the UK who was telling me that she, I mean, she has had experiences herself her whole life. Um, her children have also had the odd experience and um, and now her granddaughter was saying that some goblins were bothering her by jumping on the bed when she's trying to go to sleep so you know it's something that has is obviously in the genes in some way or, or some kind of way of being or way of seeing the world who knows that um, you know that they are experiencing the world in in this way and that uh, she was just sort of talking about it very matter of factly. This business of being passed down family lines. Before I started studying this in a more serious way, I, I would just not have taken this mm -hmm. this really as a thing. I, I would have been very suspicious of it. Um, but th there's no question that there is not just with fairy sightings, but with other areas. There seems to be some families either way. I mean, there's the classic two explanations, and presumably it's a mix of both of these. Either you have some kind of genetic predisposition, whatever that would mean in terms of the supernatural, or perhaps you have an environment where people are, let's say, more open to these yeah. things. And so the fact that a mother has an experience means that when a child has an experience like this, she's more welcoming of it. Mm -hmm. um, quite how you explain this, I don't know, but I too now have come across enough of these experiences and again not just with fairies but running down family trees where you think mm, that's 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 curious it's worth noting yeah yeah very interesting and on this subject of the the census itself um when you were coming up with those questions for the census um you know what what do you think fairies are do you have do you have a sense yourself i mean i i've never um, so in the fairy census, there's a category which is, um, do you never have supernatural experiences? Do you sometimes have supernatural experiences? Or do you um, regularly have supernatural experiences? And I, I, I think that I would be somewhere between never and sometimes on a scale mm -hmm. in terms of the supernatural and I, I'm a very rational person and probably too rational for my own good and so I, I can if, if someone were to ask me about what supernatural experiences I've had I, I've probably had five or six in my life but I, I would think of them as being hallucinations rather than actual supernatural experiences but I'm very aware that if another person had had them and maybe a person who's more open to the supernatural, they would just be simply a supernatural experience. Mm. And so I think a lot of this depends on classification. And I, I, I suppose I'm also aware, I'm also aware that um, part of being a very rational person is that you, you're constantly putting the brakes on with these things. <laughs> And you're perhaps preventing yeah. yourself. You're never touching the flame. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm in a rather unusual position in that I'm really, really fascinated by this material. Um, I mean, we're here late in the evening talking about this when both of us should be in bed. And <laughs> yeah. this, this says it all. But at the same time, I, I don't really think I have the capacity to have those experiences, or at least I've not, I've not developed that capacity. Um, and the, 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 these hallucinations that I've had sometimes in my life have not really, I would say, concerned themselves 
with anything that would be described as fairies. Mm. And I would also, perhaps the only thing I can add to that is that the reason I find fairies so fascinating is from when I was a very young child, and this is why your question at the beginning tripped me up a little bit. I've always felt that I have a very strong relationship with the countryside. Um, and um, uh, recently a friend gave me a book to read an autobiography of a surfer and this was about a guy who had surfed all through his life from eight or nine up until his 50s when he wrote the book and I was thinking afterwards what was the common thread in my life what's the th because certainly surfing isn't it okay. um, you know, so some people might say I've always read books some people might say I've always cooked and I think the one thing that I can trace all the way back to my childhood is I've had this, this very strong relationship with the countryside around me. I've always tried to live in the countryside. Um, when a couple of years I ended up living in cities, I was never really happy and would often walk to get out of the city to get to the countryside. Um, I go for a walk every day deep into the woods. This is a really, really intimate and important part of me. And I, I certainly don't have, I don't interpret these things as supernatural experiences, but for me, there's something almost ecstatic about the experience yes. of walking through the wood, being in the countryside. And so maybe one way to interpret this is that I, I don't really perhaps I sense things that are beyond my ken. Um, and by studying fairies in a rather spiritually autistic way, I'm I'm I, I'm shuffling towards other realities, let's say. Well, I think you I think you could, you know, if you look at the bigger picture, I'd say you've done much more than that in in fact, because you have inspired, you know, you've inspired my research, you've inspired many of us researchers. And um, you know, there is there is definitely, I don't, I don't know what you what you would think about this, but it feels like um there's maybe a space opening in academia to sort of look at this in a different way than we have done before and I think a lot of that is thanks to you in fact and um, you know from from your own work lots of really really interesting and important work is being done um, so thank you very much on our behalf um, and um, do you, what, what do you think about that do you think that academia is sort of shifting its view in any in any way at all I, I, look, I think that in these areas, I'm probably a bit old fashioned. For me, academia should be empirical. In other words, there should be data that you that you can study. And in this sense, we go back to me being a little bit overly rational and you know needing percentages and, and this kind of thing. And so I, I think I think that for things to be studied in academia, it's really important that in the end you're you're focusing on data yeah. now of course 500 people having fairy experiences is data there's mm. there's no there's no question about that and if people choose to study this data then i'm i'm or using their own um using their own studies or using these surveys or others like them that have been run over the last couple of years I, i'm really over the moon but again i'm, I'm perhaps a bit old-fashioned that for me that there needs to be a line drawn between what's empirical and what isn't and and for for, for instance, with Evans Wentz, Evans Wentz's fairy faith in Celtic countries began its life uh, as a, a, um, a thesis at a Rennes University in France in, in Lower Brittany, and it went on to become a doctorate at Oxford. And I, 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 I'm really glad that that book exists, but I don't think it should have ever have been allowed to be a doctorate in that the first part of the book, which describes yeah. where Evans went, there's this incredible job of collecting in fairy experiences, um, is is fabulous, and that that book should be that part of the book should be lauded to the high heavens. But I I, I would get rather anxious about people in university um, trying to prove the existence of fairies, yeah, or, or trying or trying to trying to find simple explanations and I assume within myself that that academics are the nature of academia is you're never going to get to the answers there mm. now that doesn't mean 
that you can't find those answers on your own. But I think there should be a limit in what you can study and what you can aim for. And so, for instance, Joe, if you were if you were going to do a doctorate where you wanted to understand better children who have fairy experiences, just to choose a random example, mm -hmm. I, I, I would think this would be a wonderful thing to choose. And it's such a fascinating area. And I think you'd very soon discover that fairies is, are not enough you would find there are so many examples of children having supernatural experiences or what they interpret as supernatural experiences um, it would make a fascinating doctorate you could then write 10 books on it afterwards it's such an interesting field yeah but I think that when people start to try and explain things or prove things personally I think that's you're just never going to pin that butterfly to the wall. It's it's not going to happen. And that that what's necessary is to separate the two out. Um, and maybe in our personal lives, maybe in conversations like this, the two parts start to rub up against each other and create interesting friction, um, maybe sparks, maybe even a fire. But I think in the end, academia is limited and it's right that it's it limited. is it is uh, yeah <laughs> and because otherwise yeah. it becomes an act of it, it ceases to be empirical and at that point mm. academia ceases to exist yeah. and some people would say that's a good thing and maybe they're not entirely wrong but i i think that you the search for truth in academia needs to be based on empirical information and that means that the kind of truths that you are going to find in an academic context are different from the kind of truths that you are finding on this podcast if that makes sense mm. yeah I think that it's yeah you're right that it's important to have different spaces to be able to explore these matters because if we only if we're only ever um experiencing the world through an academic lens for instance then of course we are going to be limited we are just immediately you are limiting what is possible you are limiting possibilities according to the knowledge and acceptability of the um, level or you know where academia is at that point um I, I agree time. with this passionately. Yeah, I, I think that yeah. what, what I didn't want to come across from what I was saying is that academia is somehow a key to a universe. Or, or perhaps that's OK. It's a key to our universe, but not the universe. Um, even in the best case scenario where people do empirical research, they're only going to be able to uncover certain things. Um, and I, 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 so it's 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 only part of what we can do in this world and I completely yeah. agree with that yeah yeah and I suppose you know my my approach is is more kind of um a rather than a, a thinking is a, a feeling and I wonder if I wonder if um you know that's something that we are growing to explore more is how we feel about things rather than how we necessarily how we think about things and the rational side of it then um isn't the the main ingredient then it's something that is interesting but uh you're also free to explore and you're also free to feel you know what is true for you which is not academic and or, or rational in any in any way but is is also um of equal importance i would argue so um but nevertheless your work um you know over these years has really contributed in enabling people to to see these encounters in a very different light i mean when magical folk was released it uh, was received you know, by all the sort of the mainstream newspapers and, um, you know, some people running some very interesting reports on, on the book, you know, and, uh, and I thought that that was really wonderful to see that it was being taken seriously. And of course, um, it contains a lot of the folklore as well, but there were some first-hand accounts in there. And I thought that was a really wonderful introduction for a lot of people to this area. So, you know, that's perhaps a way to do it in a, as a kind of a balance between the two.
Yeah. I, Joe, it, it goes back to what you were saying before, but I, I, I think it's really important that we, as a society, but as individuals within that society, have conversations. Yeah. Um, and I, I believe passionately that the university is, is one of the forums where that happens. And to have this, you need freedom of speech, um, yeah. and you need tolerance, and you need to yes. understand that other people might not see the things the same as you do. And there's the Definitely. battle to convince, and also perhaps the understanding that in the end, um, you're not going to convince some people, but what you're going to do is just leverage a little bit more space in their heads. Yes. Um, and I, I think all of these, all of these are positive things. Um, and th the other day I was, uh, I was looking at a poltergeist case and I came across the work of someone who could be described as a 40. And um, this was someone who had looked at poltergeist cases over 40 years. And he said this thing at the end, where I thought it's just a really lovely conclusion and it relates to how I feel really about fairies that he said um, you know I've studied this for 40 years and I know no more now than I did the first day I started studying um, and I thought that was that was a very honest thing to say yes and I, I think it's also it's also fine for that to be a conclusion in an academic setting uh, because he was trying to apply science to poltergeist phenomena mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that's a problem I, I think that perpetual ignorance is in itself not a bad thing either in yeah. other words if we can leave part of our brain unknowing um, part of our brain accepting that there are truths that we can't grasp easily or that truths that maybe will always be beyond our grasp this is also this is also fine and this is this is another form of progress totally i would absolutely agree with that yeah thank you i think that um you know we don't necessarily have to come up with the answers but but the conversations are the most important thing and so absolutely. yeah lovely so um what do you have coming up then have you got any kind of you've got the census coming up uh, that, that as we say is rolling and available on the fairy investigation society website um but um yeah do you have any other any other pieces of research coming up that you're looking at so i've actually just released that this is three or four weeks ago now um a, a book that i i spent a long time on um, and this is called the bog it um, and yes. the Boggit is this, this wonderful word that's particularly associated with the north of England and particularly, particularly with the northwest. Uh, so Lancashire, parts of Cheshire, parts of Derbyshire. And this book is represents years of work on my part, looking at the folklore and the history of beliefs about the Boggit. And so this is a book that's just come out and it's come out with University of Exeter Press. And unfortunately, um, it has academic house prices. It costs fifty pounds, um, but I should say that there is a, a companion volume which is print on demand and which you can also download free of charge. Oh, amazing! So if any of your um, if any of your listeners are interested, um, and uh, that's on my academia page. I've already put the free version of the source book up, and oh, so there's yeah. lots of yeah. great stuff there. Um, and so that's one thing. This summer, I'm also bringing out um, a book on, it's called Nail in the Skull, Victorian Urban Legends. And so this is a series of urban legends uh, from the 1800s. And here we're going beyond the supernatural into another area that I'm interested in. Not perhaps my first love, this would still be fairies, but something that over the years I've worked on. And then having finished these two quite big projects for me, I'm not really sure what comes next, um, but I, I would like, there are two major projects I'd like to carry out in what's left of my life if I'm given time. And the, the first would be, I, I would love to write a really detailed history of 19th century fairy law. Um, uh, and I, I've, I've sometimes, I have a little folder where I call it Oberon's grandchildren. In other words, these are the fairies two yeah. or three centuries after the fairies of Midsummer Night's Dream. They're the last fairies from Britain that are properly recorded. And so that would be an ambition. 
And then the other thing I'd love to do is I, I would love to publish a an atlas of the British supernatural. Um, so, for example, showing what parts of the country had what kind of beasties, what kind of fairies. Um, there are various interesting differences. I mean, just to give you a, a, a oh. one or neck of the wood, thinking of that great chapter in, in Magical Folk. Um, but there are parts of Britain um, where traditionally the fairies were called fairies and there were other parts of Britain where they were called piskies or pixies. Or So already something like that's interesting. This would be um, a map in the book and then there would be tens of other maps like this. And so th these are perhaps the big projects that as far as folklore I have ahead of me. And then I'd also like to just carry on with the fairy census um, and there, I, I don't think, as I was saying to you before, I don't think I'll come to any <laughs> any definitive conclusions. But I, 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 I find it really exciting to read these accounts um, and it keeps me it keeps me young, let's say. Um, and I, I like the idea that they can be then yeah. shared and used by people with from different positions um, to be analysed as they see fit. Yes, yes, I, I agree that, you know, the each each um, account that comes in, um, it, they're just so wonderful to read and you can really feel that person's experience in, in this. And uh, yeah, it does create a sense of wonder with the world, which I'm sure does keep you young. And those projects are absolutely amazing. And I'm really, really looking forward to that book that's being released as well. And that's great about the, the Boggart research too. So um, I'll put all of these links on. And of course, you have your Boggart and Banshee podcast that people can listen to you on as well, which is excellent. There's a really nice interplay between yourself and Chris. So uh, yeah, I've been really enjoying that. If you want to let people know about that. It's, it's disgraceful what I left that out. Chris will not be happy <laughs> if he hears this, but I, I, I was all about the books there. Um, so, yeah, a few months ago, I, um, um, together with Chris Woodyard, and thanks to advice from people like you, Joe, and uh, other people with, with podcasts of this type around the supernatural, um, we, we started to do this podcast. I think we've done seven so far or eight. We, we do it once a month. Um, and what we do is we pick a subject and usually it's a supernatural event. Um, for example, I was talking before about poltergeist. I became particularly yeah. interested in that because we were looking at the Wesley Horn thing, which was yeah. this famous case involving John Wesley's family. Um, and I do the podcast, yes, with Chris Woodyard, who's an American historian and a, an incredibly talented woman. And, um, and Chris for me has been something of a mentor. She's, a little bit older than me and I've always found her very very good for advice in my studies um whereas I, I there's probably a slight difference between us that I would say that I'm more skeptical um than Chris about some of these events um yeah. and so I think that's that's also a, a nice interplay um and so yeah that, that's been something that I've really enjoyed doing so far um and that I would love to go ahead with that with Chris um, and so that that's something else for the future. Yeah, it really comes across that you're both enjoying it as well. Um, they're, they're great to listen to. Well, thank you so much, Simon. And um, yeah, come back on also when your you know your next your projects are coming up in the future, and let us know how the next census um, is coming along as well. And whenever that's released, come and tell us about that. So yeah, thanks very much, and um, I'll speak to you again soon. And I will okay, post well, uh, all the links. Sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say thank you for having me and, um, and, and thanks for your listeners, yes, for tuning in. Oh, great. Right, thanks then and speak to you soon. Bye. Okay, take care. Bye-bye now, Joe. Bye.